Hey guys, so we have a quick break from our mediation and moderation series and I'm going to talk about how to do a structural equation model in JASP. So first things first, the sim functions that JASP is running in the background are Levon, which is an R package that you can learn about on uh, our YouTube channel. And I wanted to first start by looking at the Levon page because I think it's a really fantastic set of tutorials if you are trying to learn how to do this better. And so I recommend going, I just type Levon in and um, hit Google and this takes you to the page that they have set up for it. You can click on tutorials to look at a bunch of different examples. Now this does show this to you in R, but the way that you write the model syntax is the same. So you can use it to help you find how to write models because JASP will handle all of the analysis part for you. So this is a good resource for you if you're trying to learn how to do something specific. The other quick thing that you can look at is our, our, our own website, so Stats Tools. If you click on Learn Statistics and then click on Structural Equation Modeling, I have my entire uh, eight-week summer course, or this would be a full 16-week course in a regular semester. Uh, on Levon. It actually teaches it to you in R, but you could use these tutorials to help you learn more about just the basic concepts in SIM. So there are lectures for each one. There are also examples of how to run these in R, which you could use to learn the model syntax code to port into JASP. And then there are actually examples of assignments that we do in this class worked for, for people. So I have my entire course in order um, online linked for you guys. And you can find the files I'm going to use today in our OSF folder, which is also linked um, at the top here. So um, you can use the Levon website or you can use some of my lectures to help you say, let's say I want to do a, um, a, a multi-group CFA. So you could learn how to write some of the code for, for that. That being said, let's go over to JASP and look at um, how this works. Okay. I've also got a uh, worksheet here that we're gonna go over, but let's start with JASP. So I'm gonna pull in the Holzinger data set, which is a really classic data set that's included in the Levon package. The other thing that you can do um, is open a data set from JASP that talks about <coughs> the SIM functionality. So let's look at that one first and then go into doing our own. So if you click File, you can click Data Library. This is in the newest version of JASP, so uh, if you don't see this, be sure you download an update. Click Sim. And the Political Democracy data set is also included as part of Levon, so also a great data set. I can click to open the JASP file. And then it's got some examples uh, and then kind of an already a write up or an example of all the things that you might see. If you want to learn like what they're doing here, you click on the actual analysis and it'll show you over here how they ran it. So that's another resource for you. But if I wanted to do this from scratch, I would not close JASP. Oops. I'm going to open JASP. I'm going to open um, my <laughs> the Holzinger data set that I downloaded from R. And what's in this data set is like a um, children's um, rate, like scores on te text analysis and like visual reading speed, a couple other things. This example is the one on the Levon help page so that you can match that um, data set to an example in JASP. But if you're looking here, at just your main options under JASP, you won't see SIM. So you have to click on the little plus here and then click SIM. And it has the only option, which is Levon. So this top section here is where we're gonna write the model syntax code. So this is the part that really just takes a little bit of learning, because after that, the point and click options below are really great. So like, what do I write here to make the magic happen, basically. And so that's where our handy cheat sheet is gonna come in. So some basics, spacing doesn't matter. Um, the lines matter. So you need to hit enter to get a new equation. I put equation in quotes 
because what we're going to do is sort of write what we expect the model to look like and those are obviously uh, equations so uh, every time that you need a new latent variable or a new regression you will enter it on a new line but otherwise spacing doesn't matter so you can hit the space bar between variable names and pluses I do that because it's easier for me to read but it's not required so the main components here are going to be and the one you will use the most is definitely equals tilde so the equals tilde creates a latent variable and as described on Levon's help page this is is measured by so you can think of it equals tilde as this latent variable is measured by all these other variables what this really means is that the prediction is going from the latent variable to the manifest variables so let's add that here so prediction is that latent variable predicts the manifest variables okay. I am assuming you know a little bit about sim uh, if you're here watching this video but latent variables are ones that are not measured in your data set they're normally represented by circles on a diagram uh, a structural equation modeling diagram manifest variables are data the big data that's in your data set they're physically measured measured variables um, and those are usually represented by squares on a diagram okay. and so if you do equals tilde the arrow is going to go from the latent variable to the manifest variables and I'm in psych so this is the way that most people think about kind of psychological phenomenon that IQ is this thing that we possess that predicts the scores or the behavioral output so uh, this direction is generally that we think the latent variable is the cause um, for the measurement that we see but you can do it actually the other way and this is less common I, I talk about this in my class but I have personally never used this syntax in a paper um, which is less than tilde and so it kind of looks like if you write model code correctly quote unquote in R you do the uh, less than symbol in the dash this is very similar to that and so what you would do is um, type that the latent variables uh, the latent variable is predicted by the manifest variables so here we would say that the prediction is that the latent variable is predicted by the manifest variables sometimes these are called composite variables where let's say you're trying to create a composite of a picture of someone you might use uh, socioeconomic status education some other things that create that latent variable and that prediction kind of makes sense we're building a, per, uh, a, a picture of maybe a person's um, um, potential achievement or something now what do I write here so I, I've talked about the equals tilde and I've talked about the less than tilde what you write is the name of the latent variable on the left and all the name of the manifest variables on the right okay. the latent variable can be any name as long as it's not something in the data set or Levana Gabork um, because it needs to you are building a variable here so you name it is what I mean by that so you come up with something everything on the right variable one variable two needs to be the name of a variable from the data set so if it doesn't have a corresponding column in the data set this will not run a okay. couple of other options that you can use as a single tilde this is used uh, as a regression so that format is y tilde x which means that y is predicted by x or you can say x predicts y either way and the difference between this equals tilde and this tilde is that this is creating a latent variable where the prediction goes from the latent to the manifest variables so from left to right however when you use a single tilde the prediction is that X predicts Y so it's actually going from the right to the left okay. and so sometimes I have students have a trouble with this because um, basically it's one symbol different but the direction of the prediction is the opposite and that's because in the first two you're you're really you're creating a variable and so that's why there's um, this equals or this less than sign here we're using two names of things that are in the data in the model already 
So y is predicted by x. If you're familiar with r, this is the same order that you write it in r. Now here, the names on the left and the right need to be defined in the data set or a previous model line. So you can use latents to predict each other in a, like a fully structural model, but uh, you do need to define the latent before you use it. So the order of the lines in your model syntax also matters. Okay. So you can't use a latent variable before you've defined it. Okay. Two tildes indicates covariance or correlation or residuals. So this is really like the kind of variance um, options. And so it depends on what you use this with, but generally this does not order, uh, does, it doesn't matter what order you write it in, because remember with correlation, you can call one X and Y, but we don't have a direction of the prediction. So we're just saying they're correlated to each other. These names do need to be defined in the data set or a previously defined latent variable. So again, the order matters. You can set the variance of a variable specifically by using, and let's do this so that it's clear what's going on. Let's say variable tilde tilde, some number 12 times the variable. So if you have problems with Haywood cases, which are um, improbable solutions, you could set the variance of a variable to a specific number. You could set it to zero, you could turn it off. Uh, so you can actually um, set the coefficients um, directly. Generally, you're going to add these double tildes because you want to add a correlation between two variables that maybe are uh, correlated error terms. So you have two items that measure approximately the same thing. Uh, you might do this to turn off the automatic correlation between some, some types of variables uh, or a couple of other instances. So this is something that you will use. And then one last one, um, anytime you see variable, the way this would look is variable tilde one, that indicates that you're just talking about the intercept for that variable. I have not used the intercept code very often, but if you see it, that's what it is. So 90% of the work is gonna be with the latent variable creation and regression. So let's go over here and just do a really simple model. Um, so you can actually also import variance covariance matrix, like if you're doing this from a book. So a lot of these structural equation model books provide the variance covariance matrix, and you can actually recreate models from books by telling it to um, pull the variance covariance matrix out of your out of a data set. So you would have to type it into CSV and then use this. But um, that's a really fantastic thing about uh, reproducing these models is that you just need the variance covariance. You don't need the raw data. But if you have the raw data, go ahead and use it. Okay. okay, as a quick reminder, what are the variables in this data set? So I am not gonna use any of this other gender or any of that. I'm gonna stick with um, X123456789. So one thing you can do, let me show you, go back to Levon's homepage here. On their tutorial, um, there's a little bit of stuff, but they give you this model syntax and gives you some examples of how all this works. It's basically what I just very briefly cover, but they have a CFA example. Right. And this talks about this Holzinger data set. And so, um, when we were talking about equals tildes, what's happening is when I create this visual variable, I called it visual, that's not in the data set, equals tilde x1 plus x2 plus x3. And see how the arrows go from the visual variable to the manifest variables, x1, 2, 3. So that is saying that the prediction is that this visual factor predicts the scores on 1, 2, 3. Anytime you see these double-headed arrows, what you're getting is covariance or correlation. So we expect these to be correlated. Okay. And I have several videos on like basics of CFA and basics of what Levon does in the background that you can watch, but it will automatically correlate all these, uh, all of these types of variables. So these are um, exogenous variables, meaning the, the 
arrows only go out and they don't come in. So the arrows only go out. Um, so it will automatically correlate those, which sometimes is a surprise if you're writing a model and you've never seen that before. Okay. Um, so this is what a model syntax might look like. Okay. So I'm gonna highlight all this. So you don't have to watch me type, just paste it in. Okay. Now, um, spacing doesn't matter. So I could have run the entire line together and I don't think I can make the font any bigger, unfortunately. So um, if we come back over here, I can make this bigger. What's happening is I've typed visual, I've named it visual. I could call this Swiss cheese if I wanted to. Equals tilde, and so it's one, two, and three added together. So I put plus signs between the names of the variables in the data set to indicate that though that visual variable is comprised of all three of these. Hit enter and you'll get, you can type their next one. So what I mean by each equation gets a new line is like, this is the first equation. I am creating this visual variable. And the next equation is that I'm creating this text variable. Okay. And what's gonna happen is because these uh, don't have any predictions between each other or uh, correlations between them, it's gonna auto add the correlations so they're not just floating in space. And so you'll automatically get this covariance between them. Okay. You can turn that off, but it would be a little weird. Okay. Your variable names cannot have spaces. So one thing about the Levon tutorial over here is they're talking about it being latent variable. Oh, that's fine. You don't use spaces in your names of your variables. Okay. So I could change this to be Swiss cheese if I wanted to. Any name um, you want that's not in the data set. We'll go back to having it be visual. Uh, and then I'm going to hit Apple uh, or Command Enter. I think it's Control Enter on Windows machines. Okay. And it will run the model for you. So let's look at quick here at um, what output I get. Okay. So uh, I can delete this one because this is before I entered any kind of models and I just hit remove. Oh, not all analyses. I just want you to go away. Let's see what happens when I click remove all. I haven't tried it yet. Ah, it went away. Okay, let's come back. So here's a clue that spacing doesn't matter. Okay, it still ran. Okay, so the very first thing you'll see here is the main fit statistics um, for the model. Now it's just going to show me the degrees of freedom, AIC, BIC. These are really great for model comparison. Uh, Chi-square, change in Chi-square, which is a little odd because I haven't really added anything to this model. And if that Chi-square is significant, which is a bit useless because um, Chi-square is negatively impacted by sample size. Um, then next thing, without uh, editing any of the uh, options here gives me the parameter estimates. I was trying to make this bigger, but I don't think I can. So it kind of keeps going over here. But the parameter estimates give you a clue as to the coding of how this works. So visual till equals tilde, that matches what we did over here. So visual related to x1. Label here is a label that you can apply if you want to, and we'll do that in just a second. Estimate one. Okay, why is this a one? Well, um, this is where I really recommend watching a bunch of the videos on like the background of sim, but this is the marker variable. Sometimes it's called the scalar scaling variable because the default is to scale the data based on the, on the, or scale the model based on the indicators for each factor. Okay? We could change that if we wanted to and look at um, standardizing the entire model based on the variances. Uh, but it gives me each one of these. And if you're used to looking at Levon code, this looks a little different. I think this is actually a bit neater because I can copy this chart over. But I get each of the factor loadings, basically, is what they are. Okay. Now this is in the scale of the data. The more useful option is way over here under standardized all. Okay. Standardized all is like the completely standardized solution. This you can interpret like an uh, exploratory factor analysis. Uh, another option you can use is standardized Levon, or I'm sorry, not Levon, latent variable. This would be if you put the scaling on the variance of the latent variable instead of on the marker variable. 
So you're actually gonna see all the possible combinations of standardization or scaling right away. Okay. And this is what I teach people to do when I run this in R, because then you can see all of them and you don't have to reprogram it to only show you one of them. All right. Uh, you get the standard error for each variable and then if the parameter estimates are significant. Down here, we're gonna see uh, x1 tilde tilde x1, which looks a little weird. That's the error variance for your, for your um, manifest variables here. So this just shows you what that code would look like if you wanted to add it in. So let's say I decided that this error variance is all wrong or it's negative and it shouldn't be. It's a Haywood case. What I could do is type x1 tilde tilde, some number, let's pick two times x1. Okay. So by doing that, what we've done is we've set the variance to x1 to 2. Okay. Hit command enter, and it will update that model, and you'll now see x1, and it's now set to 2. And so it'll turn off estimating this for you because you set it to a number. Okay. So quick and dirty on how to set specific parameter estimates. I'm going to turn that off, go back to the real model. Down here, now um, visual, tilde, tilde, visual, this is the variance for the latent variables. Okay. Skip down a little bit more. Now I've got visual, tilde, tilde, textual. This is the covariance between the latent variables. Covariance, very difficult to interpret. So scroll, 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 scroll. Get all the way over here to standardized all. That is the correlation between latent variables. So you automatically get the correlations. You'll notice here under standardize all the variances for the um, latent variables are set to one. That's how it's standardizing it. So it's kind of moving from the, the marker variable to the um, latent variable. Okay. Now this labels thing, what can I do? Labels are handy if you want to um, set two variables equal to each other. So let's say I know x1 and x2 should be the same estimate. Okay. All right, I'm sorry, let's do x2 and x3. So I know that those should probably be exactly the same for whatever reason. Okay. I can call both of those parameter or those coefficients any word I want, as long as it's not a name of something in the, in the, um, in the data set. So I'm gonna do coif, times. Okay. Now if I just update the model now, you'll see that I've labeled it as COIF. Okay. Maybe not so useful. Now what I could do though is force an equality between the coefficients for one, x2 and x3 by giving them the same name. Okay. And by forcing that equality, you'll see now that they have the exact same estimate. So this is really nice if you have an unidentified model because you don't have maybe, you only have two um, manifest variables and you need to set them the same to deal with identification. I have a whole video on that specific problem um, and this is how you might fix it. Okay. So they're really, it's really handy to deal with um, potential model issues with identification or scaling. All right, now quick, let's get into what are the options down here. Okay. So I can cal do different types of error calculation. I could get additional fit measures, which to me is much more handy because now I can see uh, my more common fit indices that are reported at least in psych. So the CFI is one of the big ones. So it's 0.931. I often see the TLI, you get the NNFI, the NFI, PFI, blah, blah, blah. blah. Okay, I have a whole video on what are all these alphabet soups if you want to learn more about the individual fit indices and what they are. Okay. AIC and BIC again, down here to our badness of fit statistics, the REMC, uh, its confidence interval, and the SRMR, some more popular one, okay. and some even more. So you get way, way more fit statistics. Um, you can also pick up a the Levon book, it's Latent Variable Modeling in R by Bojan, who talks where I got all my lecture notes from. Okay. Uh, you can look, there's even more stuff. The most common thing you're gonna pick is additional fit measures. Under options here, this is where you can start working on grouping variables. You can learn about multi-group factor analysis. Um, 
you can set equality constraints for all these different options. So this is something you would want to maybe learn about multigroup analysis first. What is it? How does it work? And then this section will make a little more sense. Where you could pick um, to set some equality constraints on maybe, let's say, the loadings. Okay. And you could look at each group uh, one at a time. If you wanted to change the uh, way this is estimating, so maximum likelihood, generalized least squares, weighted least squares, unweighted least squares, I forget what the last one is. The Levon help page talks about what all of these are and how they work. You can include mean structure. That's going to be really popular if you're, are going to be useful if you have a grouping variable. Assume un factors uncorrelated will turn off those extra correlations. So it would make visual detect zero. Uh, let's see here, factor scaling. I would honestly would tell you to leave this one alone because if I change it to residual variance, all I'm gonna see is that it'll change the main column to be STD LV. So the, the default here will show you all of the possible options on the, on the, the regular factor loading scaling, on the latent variable, or to me, the more helpful one, standardize all. So you kind of see all of them already you don't necessarily need that option. Okay. Uh, under advanced, there's even more options. <laughs> so you can uh, completely customize um, the analysis that normally you would do kind of through uh, programming separate models of the lot. If you wanna save the models as different, you can actually switch um, and name this one model two, and then we can make some edits. So, how, what would I might edit? Hmm, I could always turn on modification indices and look at those down here on the bottom. So modification indices are gonna tell me what options I might consider adding to the model to make it better. And this really depends on the model you're working with uh, and the options and your field and theory and stuff. But let's say we know X7 and X8 are very similar variables. So I might consider adding that as a correlated error. So I would type it as x7 tilde tilde x8, just like you see here. So the left hand and right hand operators, you can just copy that directly. Go back, where'd we go? I didn't apply it, x7 plus x8. I'm gonna hit command enter or control enter to run. Oops, oh, I did plus, sorry, tilde tilde. Okay. By giving this a new name, as model two down here under options, it actually now will show me the differences between models. So this is the uh, Nova function in R, but that shows me when I added this new equation, now I can see the difference between models. So the difference in chi-square here is um, between model one and model two, okay. which you can just see like, or actually it's giving me model two to saturated. Um, but so now I can come down here and look at this last line. Um, the difference here, 32 points, is the difference between 85 and 53 here. So we would say this is significant change, but that doesn't mean a whole lot when it comes to sim. All right, let's come down here and let's look at our fit indices. So we could look at model one's fit indices and then model two's fit indices and see which one we like better. Unfortunately, I think it only shows you one model's fit indices at a time. So you'd have to go back to model one to look at those fit statistics or hit okay and run a completely different uh, model here. But when I updated that, now you'll see X7 tilde tilde X8. So this has added a correlated error. The only other thing that I would love if JASP would add here is there are some really great plotting options. They're kind of hideous if you have lots and lots of squares but this would help you visualize how this might should look um, to make sure that you're writing the code correctly. So that's the only thing I see. Otherwise, I think this is a really great um, way to take normally completely R code and make it a little bit easier um, and make it point and click. Okay. So one last plug, if you really wanna learn more about the actual nitty gritty for Sim, um, you can watch the, the lectures on like the like just material and then if you watch some of the example videos 
you the very first thing I always do is talk about the model syntax. So you could take that model syntax and type it into uh, JASP here. And then you can ignore me when I talk about CFAs and summaries. Um, but the, the numbers you get should show up exactly the same as well as um, uh, the interpretation of what's going on. So you can kind of use some of this other, these other demonstrations that I have to help you learn how to write the right type of model syntax, as well as the Levon help page. Okay. So re re uh, re viewer request for SIM in JASP, that's the short and dirty version. Uh, if you have more specific requests, just let me know. So that's SIM in JASP using Levon.